Uh, we're going to begin with Joanna's paper, and I'll just give you a little bit of background uh, to her. Uh, as I said, she's a PhD candidate at the UHI in the Centre for History there. Uh, she was born and brought up in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, uh, and moved with her family uh, to uh, uh, Scotland when she was in her teens, uh, settling in Loch Abbey, Glengarry. Uh, at school in Fort Augustus, she uh, uh, came across people who were interested in the cultural aspects uh, of uh, the, the Highlands, Islands and other parts of Scotland. Uh, when she finished school at Fort Augustus, she went to St. Andrews, where she did her MA uh, in modern history uh, and uh, uh, an, M uh, an MA in international relations and modern history and an MLit in modern history. She then went on to work uh, at the University of St. Andrews Museum, uh, gathering experience in uh, the world of uh, heritage uh, and uh, uh, public interaction. Uh, her interest uh, for her PhD thus uh, has uh, arisen both from uh, personal experience as, as well as studies. Uh, her work uh, to date has been uh, published in part already, and we look forward to hearing from her now. Uh, her topic is Island Homecomings Towards Understanding Contemporary Islanders' Perspectives on Diaspora, Heritage, and Ancestral Tourism to Tyree. Over to you, Joe. Thanks very much, Maggie. I'll just play around with my screen. Here we go. Um, it's such a such a pleasure to be here today and well here in my living room um but to, to have you chair the session makes this um especially special for me um and before i begin i'd like to say thanks to my supervisor um ian robertson and to donald make john holiday and rhoda make who read drafts of uh, versions of this paper and offered some comments um, and thanks also to the committee at the so scottish society for northern studies for inviting me to speak today um, and to Tanya for that for that lovely um, piece from her earlier. And I look forward to maybe diving into the breakout session with her later on and picking her brain. Um, but for now, I'm going to take you back to my first research visit to Tyree in 2017. So John paused at his front door as I left his house in the west of Tyree after our second interview unaware that what he was about to say would challenge me to reconsider the foundations and direction of my doctoral research. He had spent the previous hour telling me about his passion for engaging with members of what he called the Tyree diaspora around the world. In 2016, he explained, he chaired a committee of island residents who together organised a homecoming festival in the island, which they called Avuang, which is Gaelic for, for the harvest. Avuang was a week-long festival of heritage-focused events, which drew people to Tyree from around the world to explore, commemorate and celebrate their connections to the island alongside contemporary residents. In 2016, Islanders organised a second homecoming, expanding the events programme and welcoming more attendees. When I first learned about the Tyree homecomings at the beginning of 2017, I was in the very early stages of my doctoral research, and I was broadly interested in understanding the interplay between ancestral tourism and Scottish heritage. Ancestral tourism is defined as any visit which might be partly or wholly motivated by a need to connect or reconnect with an individual's ancestral past. I plan to carry out a series of case studies across Scotland, exploring residents and visitors' perspectives on heritage in ancestral tourism contexts. It seems that Tyree would be a good place to start, so I travelled to the island to interview residents. John was my first interviewee. He helpfully answered each of my prepared questions, 
but his responses also extended far beyond the topics I had anticipated. He spoke passionately about his personal motivations for organizing a Buang and told me about his voluntary work at Anilin, the island's heritage center, which he helped to establish in the mid 1990s. I'm so interested in cultural and geographical ties that make the community stronger, he told me. And a Vuang is by far the most successful one I've ever been involved in. John's knowledge of and enthusiasm for ancestral tourism to Tyree was seemingly evident. So I was confused when he turned to me in the doorway after our second interview and said thoughtfully, I am surprised. Well, surprised is not the word, but this is a very rich and important topic. I thought you were going to come to talk to me about ancestral tourism. And to be honest, I don't really care about that. In the days and weeks following this casual comment, I find myself contemplating the apparent incongruity between John's enthusiastic engagement with members of the Tyree diaspora who visit the island and his self-proclaimed indifference towards ancestral tourism. And this stayed at the forefront of my mind as I spoke to more islanders about Abuang during the following two weeks and was repeatedly informed that the homecomers were in fact not tourists. They were far more special than that. I was told. By the time I boarded the ferry back to Oban a fortnight after that conversation with John, I no longer thought of Tyree's homecoming festivals as one possible case study in a broader project about ancestral tourism and Scottish heritage. Rather, I had begun to appreciate that such a national framing would risk obscuring rather than revealing how islanders situate route-seeking tourists to Tyree into historical and cultural narratives which have specific meanings and resonances for contemporary residents. And I was also beginning to understand that Islanders' interactions with and interest in ancestral tourists were not limited to the two homecoming events, but were in fact, it were in fact far more entangled with their everyday lives than had been initially apparent to me. So in order to make sense of how Tyree residents described ancestral tourists, and to understand how their perspectives were informed by their interpretations of the island's past, I needed to adapt my methodology and find appropriate conceptual frameworks for interpreting my findings. Rather than conducting multiple case studies across Scotland, I decided to carry out a multi-sided ethnography focused on ancestral tourism to Tyree. As George Marcus explains, multi-sided ethnography involves following connections, associations, and putative relationships between people, metaphors, stories, things, and lives. Attention is paid to multiple sites of observation and participation that cross-cut dichotomies such, such as the local and the global. The following year, I moved to Tyree, where I lived for around six months carrying out participant observation and interviewing both islanders and ancestral tourists. I returned multiple times for shorter visits and continued communicating with many respondents in the island and overseas after the in-person fieldwork had ended. Throughout 2017 and 2018, I also carried out participant observation at Tyree Association events in Glasgow and online in Facebook groups, mailing lists and websites focused on Tyree ancestry and history. Alongside this first-hand research, I also read widely about the history, culture and living traditions of Tyree, situating my findings within the context of ethnological research previously carried out by Maggie Mackay herself, Eric Krugin, Donald Meek and others. And I also find Tanya Boltman's research on associational culture and local homeland reference especially illuminating. Yet what I was observing and being told in Tyree appeared not to fit into the dominant frameworks which are currently used to interpret ancestral tourism in Scotland. It's important to highlight that ancestral tourism has been explored by scholars from a diverse range of disciplines. And this multidisciplinary literature is challenging to navigate and difficult to summarize without appearing reductionist, especially in the very limited time that I have today. However, it is possible to identify some commonalities across the literature. The focus is almost exclusively on visitors' experiences 
And there's very little systematic research which explores and contextualizes the perspectives of residents who interact with ancestral tourists. Despite this, there is a consistent argument across the literature <clears throat> that Scottish residents are ambivalent about or even hostile to members of the Scottish diaspora who visit Scotland and that ancestral tourism is irrelevant to contemporary Scottish residents apart from its economic benefits. Paul Basu's study of ancestral tourism to the Highlands and Islands in the early 2000s remains the most in-depth study on the topic and is deservedly still influential. Basu concludes that the senses of connection, depth, resonance, fit, authenticity, belonging and being in place, which Scotland seemed to confer, have ultimately little to do with Scotland itself. The homeland, rather, is a product of the diasporic imagination. And a study of home, Homecoming Scotland in 2009 concluded that the relationship between the diaspora and the homeland is essentially a nostalgic and backward looking one relating to a Scotland which does not, and maybe never did, exist. In another study, heritage professionals at 29 heritage sites across Scotland were interviewed about their experiences with ancestral tourists. And the authors concluded that people working in the heritage sector seek to negotiate the encounter of the authentically imagined Scotland with the existing place and culture. It is the transformation of a destination into a land of origins and ancient provenance by and for this section of ancestral tourism demand. Each of these statements convey a particular understanding of what heritage is and what counts as heritage. The main point of reference is always national Scottish heritage. This Scottish heritage is an economic resource and is consumed at heritage sites. There is authentic Scottish heritage within Scotland or the existing place and culture. And on the other hand, there is nostalgic, backward looking or authentically imagined diasporic Scottish heritage. And the argument that emerges is that ancestral connections to places, people and cultural practices may be valued by international tourists, but such connections to the past are irrelevant to the lives and concerns of contemporary Scottish residents, except in terms of their potential for economic benefit. Laura Jean Smith has influentially demonstrated that there is a hegemonic discourse about heritage, which acts to constitute the way we think, talk and write about heritage. She calls this the Authorised Heritage Discourse, or AHD. The AHD works to create and sustain seemingly uncontested and cohesive narratives about the past, which are typically situated in the context of contemporary national identity. The AHD focuses attention on material traces of the past in objects or sites, which are portrayed as having fixed or authentic meanings, which require interpretation by heritage experts for ordinary people, especially tourists. Smith specifically highlights how the association of the inauthentic with tourism has set up a powerful intellectual framework that works against a full rounded understanding of what it is to be a tourist and what it is that tourism and tourists do. Consequently, she points out, little consideration is given to the interaction that occurs between host communities and tourists and what ultimately may be created by this interaction. Yet there are other ways of understanding what heritage is and who participates in creating meanings around the past. Within the field of heritage studies, the focus has shifted away from official, national and economic frameworks and obsessions with authenticity. Instead, heritage is increasingly understood as an active, relational process through which people create meanings around their pasts at multiple overlapping scales. There is growing recognition that heritage is intangible or embodied in people rather than in inanimate objects or physical sites. And more attention is now paid to what Ian Robertson calls heritage from below, which is conceptualized as heritage crafted by the ordinary people themselves as active agents in their own right, such that they become not only consumers of heritage, but also makers, keepers of their own pasts. When I 
first met John, he told me that if I wanted to see into the heart of a Wuhan, all I had to do was ask people to talk about it. He predicted, I think a lot of people's faces will light up and they will start to feel as I am, really, really passionate about what happened and why it happened and what it might lead to. In the weeks after John told me that he was not interested in ancestral tourism, I interviewed a wide range of islanders, from students in their 20s to crofters in their 80s, from people like John who had moved to the island from elsewhere to those who had been brought up in Tyree. He was right. I found that simply mentioning the words of Wuhan or homecoming to an islander could elicit a story about visitors who had come to Tyree to connect with their ancestral roots. And many of these stories took place outside the homecoming festivals, in everyday settings such as the pub or, part of, or as part of smaller family gatherings. I was most struck by how the majority of respondents insisted that these visitors are in fact not tourists, but were special. When I asked how they would describe the visitors, they offered alternative descriptions which situated them firmly into narratives about local family histories and the island's past. Some described the visitors as family coming home, mentioning their own distant kinship connections with people living overseas and on the Scottish mainland. Ian told me that he was in touch with a lot of my own relatives who have left Tyree, including one family in Canada who are descended from his distant relative who emigrated in the 1920s. It was common for respondents to refer in passing to their distant family links to other residents as well as those living beyond the island. Some know their genealogies in detail and told me that they learned their slanyu or patronymic from other family members. However, for many, it seemed that genealogical proximity is less important than the simple fact of kinship, often encapsulated by liberal use of the word cousin. Referring to his relatives, both in Tyree and in Canada, Donald Meek explained, there is a very real sense in which closeness in terms of genealogy doesn't matter all that much. If they are related to you at all, they are your kith and kin, and it doesn't matter what degree of kith and kin they are, they are related to you, and you handle them like that. Tyree residents from elsewhere in the UK who do not have historical family connections to the island told me that attitudes to genealogy and kinship in Tyree were different to those in other places they had lived. Peter has lived in Tyree for over 15 years and he attributed these differences to the continued influence of Gaelic cultural practices in the island, as you can see from what he says here. So when ancestral tourists arrive in Tyree, they are stepping into a specific historical and cultural context in which they are understood to be meaningfully part of some contemporary islanders' personal heritages and thus claimed as family. However, genealogy was only one of multiple overlapping frameworks within which island residents situate ancestral tourists and interpret their own personal heritages. In fact, it was more common for residents to describe these visitors in terms of their relationship to the island itself. Some described them as part of Tyree or Tyree people. Terms more typically associated with national identity were also used. They are patriots or patriotic, I was told, and others emphasized the spiritual relationship ancestry focused visitors have with the island. People who travel to Tyree to explore their ancestry are pilgrims, insisted both Jamie and Ian because they're on a pilgrimage back home, Jamie explained. Of, of course, genealogy and place are entangled in the Gaelic language itself. The question Kuasahau translates directly into English as who are you from, and is answered with the name of a place. Unsurprisingly then, some residents use genealogical language to describe the relationship that ancestry focused visitors have with Tyree. John described them as part of the Tyree family, and suggested that they might even be considered as a sort of community clan for whom shared connections to place are as significant and meaningful as genetic kinship. It's a return to a place rather than a return to a clan, which is a very key difference, he said. And Ian explained that these visitors are sometimes called clown and yorna, children of the barley, after cheer and yorna, 
or the land of barley, a historical name for Tyree. This was why Islanders chose the name Avuan for the homecoming. As one organizer explained, it grew from the idea of the corn and all the seeds spreading out around the world. And then you bring everybody back and we try to put the sheaf back together again, sort of thing. Ancestral tourists are thus claimed as part of the island's history, part of the intangible cultural heritage embodied by people. Bringing everybody back for the Tyree homecoming was not motivated by economic benefit, national pride or futile nostalgia. Rather, islanders are using ancestral tourism to develop and strengthen feelings of belonging to a place and an imagined community of people who live in and beyond the One homecoming organizer told me, you have to work at making people feel valued and feel part of a community. And he described everyone as another way of tying folk who are living in this community into being Tyree. National Scottish heritage was remote from this ancestral tourism event, and even genealogy seemed less important than developing and deepening a relationship with the place and its pasts. Laura moved to Tyree from England a decade ago, and she told me she had no prior connection to the island and no personal interest in genealogy. But she was deeply enthusiastic about the homecomings, telling me that the festival is not just about genealogy, is it? It's about learning about the culture of the island and showing it off. Islanders pointed out that ancestral tourists can be active participants in this heritage work. It's a two-way thing, one volunteer at Anielan told me, explaining that some visitors bring information and offer new perspectives on island's history. Many respondents told me they wanted to hear the, the visitors' stories about what life had been like for their ancestors in Tyree and what had happened to them after they emigrated. As Norma put it, it's quite an exciting thing to do and see all these people coming back that have got ancestors, you know, from a way, way back, and you can hear their stories. She said, it's like you're living on this island all your life and people who come to visit it have more information on it. And Tony told me, I think they had perhaps a better understanding of Tyree's history than some of the people that are here, that are there regularly, if I'm honest. They knew more about the island. They knew more about some of its history than the regular Joe. <clears throat> and Donald is even more specific, as you can read in this longer quote from him. And this echoes Maggie Mackay's findings in the 1980s that collective memory amongst the descendants of emigrants from Tyree has thrown light on Tyree matters on which the Scottish sources are silent. As my fieldwork progressed, I, I began to appreciate the extent to which the authorised heritage discourse has shaped and limited how we think, talk and write about ancestral tourism and heritage in Scotland. I had expected most islanders to be ambivalent about the Tyree homecomings or to tell me about the economic impact of the festivals. I had expected them to speak about ancestral tourists to Tyree from overseas, not from Glasgow, Inverness and Edinburgh too. I had been concerned that I might struggle to find respondents beyond the homecoming organising committee, or that people might have forgotten most of their experiences at a festival they attended almost a year before I began my fieldwork. Instead, it appeared that many islanders like John considered this an important topic. The stories of these visitors were linked to challenges faced by contemporary Tyree residents, which intersect with and resonate with these histories of emigration and feelings of being disconnected from the past. It seems that the presence of ancestral tourists in Tyree makes visible legacies of absences and losses still felt in the island today. The rapid decline of Gaelic as a community language ongoing depopulation and associated loss of cultural heritage practices and knowledges, a lack of historical information about thousands of islanders who emigrated over the previous two centuries. But each conversation about ancestral tourists was rooted in the present and also looked to the future. And this was encapsulated by Ethel McCallum when she told me, now that's your heritage, the young people that are not even born yet, that's the heritage of Tyree, and long may it thrive. I mean, our generation will be all dead and gone, but if you can keep the crafting, the fishing, the language, the music, the language in particular, 
Ho fad, what is it now? The world will go on. As long as we have music and bar chalk and interaction with the music and the songs and the stories, they must never let that die away. And I think the Buang is a very good example of that. And that's why people are coming back. They wouldn't come back if they weren't interested in, well, what were we like? And we want to know what they're like. Approaching ancestral tourism and heritage from below thus reveals other perspectives which have hitherto been unexplored or overlooked. Seemingly fixed binaries such as authentic, inauthentic, expert, consumer, and even resident, tourist, are unsettled. Calling into question the very usefulness of the term ancestral tourism. Rather than reject this terminology completely, however, I suggest that we should instead use heritage from below to better understand and accommodate the complex and multifaceted ways in which ancestral pasts are experienced, made meaningful and used by and for both visitors to and residents of places like Tyree. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed, Joe, for uh, an insightful and engaging presentation. Uh, I think everyone uh, here today will want to, uh, to echo uh, that. Uh, let me just start my video. <laughs> um, and uh, it uh, brought back for me a range of interesting memories and encounters. Something that I realized as a Canadian coming uh, to Tyree, um, expected because I was Canadian and nothing else that I would at least be interested. Uh, this was in the early 1970s. And uh, I was taken quite uh, quite quickly by Eric Krajin to visit uh, one of the uh, people that he had been gathering a good deal of material from. This was a man named Hector Kennedy who lived in Hillipol. And uh, Hector uh, uh, came, came out from his house, he, he saw us coming and he came out to the gate uh, to welcome us. And uh, Eric gave my name and said I was from uh, from Western Canada. And Hector said nothing. He just took my hand and he began to sing that song, Manitoba, which was composed <laughs> by an immigrant in the early uh, uh, 1880s, uh, one, one new year, very soon after uh, his emigration, and sent back as a letter to Tyree uh, um, uh, people would, there would know from the meter what uh, uh, tune these uh, words should be sung to. And that, along with quite a number of things of that kind, I think gave people in Tyree itself a, a kind of sense of Canada, uh, like the mittens that used to be sent uh, uh, from uh, from Canada at Christmas time to people in Tyree in the 20s and 30s that they treasured for years and years. So I I do want to thank thank you very very much indeed uh, uh, for this. It's given all of us a lot to think about. <clears throat>